Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com or also on BitChute and YouTube as Speaking Podcast. I also have the Awakening Podcast, Learn Polish Podcast, Meditation Podcast, and the Crypto Podcast, and all can be found on RoyCollin.com. Today, my guest, based in America, please welcome Eddie Rice. Thank you, Roy. So I'm looking forward to this because it's kind of a little different because you kind of teach people how to prepare speeches and everything, but you might introduce yourself to the listeners. Sure. I'm a speechwriter, so I help people craft toasts, keynote speeches, t TEDx talks, and everything in between. So obviously you've got your competent and experience, but going back as Eddie is a little boy, how, how, how did your journey start? Were you quite shy or were you, you know, at the front of the class jumping up and down? A little bit of a mix of both. Um, I think I was pretty shy for the most part in class. But if I was given the opportunity to perform, then I would uh, usually love to take the stage and get out there and be my best self. But I would be the person in the back of the room, not having their hand raised, not wanting to get called on by the teacher whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. I know you've been in Toastmasters. Did the Toastmasters start your journey or was it something that you just kind of done as you were doing this business? I think my journey truly started in college. Um, it went back to a class I took on rhetoric in antiquity. We studied the greats, we studied Cicero, we studied Aristotle, and we actually had to give many speeches during that class. And that really helped me uh, know that this could be a path for me in life. It wasn't until I was teaching in Austin, Texas that I joined Toastmasters and started to really take the craft of public speaking and speech writing seriously. And did you stay in Toastmasters long? Uh, not too long, probably about three years, enough to get my first manual done. So that's the first 10 speeches that you have to do. Um, but I moved away from Austin and didn't find a club again. And I'm hoping to restart at, so, at some point. Yeah, no, because when I, I was in it for about four years, and when I joined it, they had their manuals as well, which I found fantastic. But they have a new system now, it's called Pathways, and it's not the same. And I found that manual is brilliant because it kind of covers every single thing, you know, between radio and everything and vocal variety, the whole lot. And you definitely develop skills because you're concentrating on a certain thing. And by the end of it, you, you've jumped leaps and bounds from when you walked in the door. That's what I loved about it. I loved getting feedback at every meeting, doing the table topics where they give you those random rapid fire questions that you have to answer on the spot. And then just being there and part of a positive community that was there to lift you up and to help you. Um, it was, you know, for $6 a month, it was the best money you could spend on public speaking coaching, I think, hands yeah. down. Yeah, totally agree with you, totally agree with you. So with the speech writing then, cause like it does, you, I know you do it for all different things from weddings and every, even there's a one for, for politicians at, to give stump speeches. And honestly, I didn't even know what that was. I had to look it up. So basically that's repeating a, a speech. So I'd like you to kind of go into the different things, both the stump speeches and say the best man speeches and how you go about that teaching people. Sure. So there's a common core at all of these speeches where I start out with a brainstorming survey. Um, I can't start from scratch when I'm working from some, with somebody. Instead, they have to give me their ideas, and I help shape those ideas. I, I tell people I'm more of a partner rather than a writer for them. And that really gets them on board to share their ideas, share their story, and put it into the most appropriate format. So we choose you know, which stories they're going to tell. We choose you know, how they're going to open their speech, how they're going to end their speech. And that structure then helps me write the whole speech together. But of course, there's feedback that goes into it where we're trading drafts back and forth uh, to get their feedback and my feedback. And we calibrate what the message is supposed to be in the end. And like for whether it's speech or whatever, I, are you getting, say, let's a best man speech. Are you getting them to do the speech then as well and record themselves so that you're evaluating that? Is that part of the business? Yes, if they want that. Um, for some people, they just want the written speech and then I don't hear from them again until they gave it and they'd say, hey, it went really well. Others want some help where we get on the Zoom and we practice the speech for an hour. Um, and usually that's enough for a five minute speech to, to practice you know, 10, 15 times over. 
uh, I definitely love that part of it where I'm able to give them feedback and then I can hear the speech out loud and that helps me understand, okay, did that line land or did that line not land? And then that gives me another round where I can go back and edit the speech. So basically when you're doing, you're doing it, okay, they do the speech, you're listening, you're making comments, then they do it again. So you do it a few times during the, an hour call. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because I, yeah, I would have thought they'll do it. Then you go away, you organize another call next week or whatever and do the next part. So no, that's, that's brilliant that you can actually get it done in that amount of time. That's why I like working on short speeches because we can make the most out of that hour together. And if we need more hours, we can definitely add them in. But it's really hard to practice a long keynote speech where we'd have to tackle each section individually. If it's a 20 minute or 45 minute keynote, that's a lot harder to prep. It just takes a lot more time to help the speaker out because there's so many more moving parts to it. So with the keynote, because I'm always asking people like how they structured their chemo, keynotes and everything, because everyone has a different way. But when you're writing it, what, what kind of advice are you giving people? What's the best way to, because I mean, at the end of the day, you're trying to satisfy your, your client and also connect with the audience. I mean, that's kind of the objective. Of course, um, I look for stories first. I, I figure out what stories the person wants to tell and figure out the best uh, structure and the best uh, path to put those stories into. Uh, so that's where we start for the, just the heart of the speech. And of course, we figure out the key message that the speaker wants to get across and then understanding how that message fits in with each individual story. You don't want to go up there and tell irrelevant stories to your speech, which happens to way too many people. They start telling a story and they don't have any point to give. And you're just like, what did I just listen to for the last five minutes? Instead, there's always that test of relevancy with every single story that you want to tell in your speech. Does it amplify your main message and get your audience closer to understanding what you want them to understand? Once I have that part, then we'll go back and craft the opening and the closing. Those are a little bit easier once you know what is going to go on in the middle of the speech. Okay. And I know that you cover humor as well as storytelling. And I presume with, say, like a best man speech, you would try to incorporate humor. So how, how, what's the kind of skill set that you're trying to get in that? Are you getting the humor from them or are you incorporating your own kind of things that you know have already worked? Well, humor is really tricky. Um, what I tell people is don't force it. If you're not that typically kind of funny person who can tell a joke or tell a funny story, I tell people, you know, maybe go for a more sentimental speech rather than having that one with all those one-liners that get people laughing. Um, they typically don't go over that well because they, the audience has heard many of those jokes before. And I tell people, you know, stay away from like this, the really bad, irrelevant and irreverent jokes. Um, those are never going to work and you're going to probably embarrass or anger someone in the crowd that night. So stay away from it. However, if you do have funny stories to tell, definitely tell those um, rather than just having a joke that you want to tell. Because if the story doesn't come off as funny, it may still come off as sentimental and you'll be saved that way. Um, but sometimes I do find opportunities to add humor into a speech. One technique that I like to do is I find a book, a movie, uh, a song that the bride and groom or the couple, if it's a bride and a bride or a groom and a groom, um, this is 2022, um, something that the couple loves. And I work that into the closing toast. So if they're Metallica fans, if they're fans of the movie, The Sandlot, um, there's quotes that you can use from those. And it gives a little bit of a laugh at the end with that closing toast. And uh, people love it. No, brilliant. I remember I was doing a best man speech for my friend. And uh, like he was very close to his family. So I said, he's such a mummy's boy. He's still attached to the umbilical cord. And it went on well, except because I was at the head table. I remember the look his mother gave me. Everybody else was on the ground laughing and she just gave me a look that would scare Putin. Like it was like, oh God, what's going on now? But you know, it, it's a great feeling when you actually, because I afterwards and, and I was terrified. Like I think, you know, my nail marks are still on the lectern. Like that was prior to me doing Toastmasters, you know, but uh, it, it's, it's a great feeling. I remember I didn't drink either. I, I was conscious. I do not want to wreck this. I want to have it perfect. And then afterwards I can relax. And what happened is after the speech, I just went away and I went to the bar, got my Jack Daniels and Coke, my, you know, drink that I liked at the time. 
and I just stayed there for a while. I was talking to another guy, and later they were actually all looking for me. That the, after the bride and groom dance is the best man and the bridesmaid dance, and they couldn't find me. So, <laughs> up an important point is the drink after your toast and not before. If you go on YouTube, you'll see too many wedding toast fails where people have definitely drank before, and it doesn't. Ne it never turns out well. No, exactly. I mean, I, I can understand maybe somebody having one just to kind of, you know, loosen the nerves, but yeah, not getting drunk. And, you know, it's, you're, you're definitely going to make a mistake. Like, so, like, I, I saw as well, you're, you're, you've done blogs. And I'm just curious, have the blogs kind of helped the professionals? Because well? I, I know I, I don't do blogs myself, but I know that some people, by the blogging, it leads to a kind of lead generation. Is that how it works for you? Is that the way you? It does to an extent. Um, it really depends on your Google rank um, and you know how much traffic you're getting to your website. But I use the blogs as kind of proof of what I can do and what I can show people. Um, obviously, I can't show them individual speeches because most of those are under NDAs unless I have permission to give them. So the blog is another way for me to show my expertise. And I think it's really more closer to the middle of the funnel where someone's trying to make that decision to say, ooh, do I want to go with this person or not? Let me read what they have written, and that's going to help me uh, determine if this person is the right fit for me. So I wrote various blogs on different, different speeches that I can write in the hopes that someone will read them and say, hey, this is the right fit for me. I want to go with this person over somebody else that I found on the internet. No, brilliant. And I know that like you help a nonprofit as well, whether it's fundraising or awareness and I mean, I know there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of corruption in that field as well, but let's hope it's the good boys that are coming to you. Like yeah. for say fundraising, for what, like what's the best way of doing? It? Because at the end of the day, you're trying to, you know, the people in the room, you're trying to get, get them to depart with as much money as they want and be happy about it. I think a huge part for fun, for nonprofits with, when it comes to fundraising is for them to tell their story, the story of how they help people. Where is that money going to go? Is it going to go to your staff, which is fine at times, but how is it going to directly help the people that you are trying to serve? And it's wrapping that up in a narrative, in a story that donors can identify with, that they can see themselves making an impact. Because too often when I'm trying to give to a nonprofit, if I think they're way too big, if I think too much money is going to go to administrative costs and overhead, um, that makes it less likely that I'm going to give. But if I know that the money is going to be used directly in aid in helping somebody, then I'm much more likely to give, and so are your donors. Yeah, no, because I know I was exposing that and the uh, thing that I wrote, I didn't release it yet, but it was like some of the charities, 1% goes to the actual charity and others 3%, and, and like big ones that, you know, you, you, you kind of go, what's going on here? So, and with the, with the raising awareness, and I also actually just going back, like with humor, because at the end of the day, you're trying, if it's an event that they're at, right? Because I understand if you're creating a video or something like that for the marketing purposes, but if they're going into, say, an event and they're doing the speech, I know telling the story, whether it's cancer research or whatever, and, you know, obviously sometimes there's a bit of pain involved. Would you keep humor out of it or would you include it because at the end of the day you're trying to get the feel good factor as well what's your thoughts on that one i think when it's appropriate you can definitely include it 100 um, percent. i think it really though depends on your audience and what you're there for you know what type of event it is so if it's a more solemn event then of course you know humor is not going to work too well unless you need to break the ice a little bit but i think for the most part um, there are plenty of nonprofit speakers out there heads of nonprofits that could you know, lighten up their speech with a little bit of humor appropriately placed. Um, I think that's not a bad thing to do whatsoever. That's brilliant. And next thing though is when you're dealing with a client, because we all want the ideal client, you tell them what to do, they go ahead and do it. You tell them the advice, they go ahead and do it. There's some people that do nothing. It's in life. It's unfortunately, what do you do when you have that? Because at the end of the day, you're trying to come across to get referrals and look as good as you can but when you know they're basically doing nothing when they should be because I, I assume you've experienced that oh very much um that was probably one of the early mistakes that i learned early on was not to take on everyone as a client and to set expectations up early early on so in my speech writing agreement i talked through what the process is going to look like and on that first call with the client i talked them through 
hey, you know, we're going to be doing a questionnaire. We're going to be doing follow-up phone calls. Are you going to be available for the, these moments when we do talk through these things? And if they're not going to be available or if they think their assistant is going to handle it, then I tell them I'm not the right fit and I'm not going to be able to work with them. So it's really about figuring out whether it's a match early on. But if someone, you know, let's say agrees to all of that and then doesn't do it, well, then I'm following up with them quite often to get the speech written, but then reminding them that this is a partnership, that if I don't get anything from them, I can't write a speech from scratch. You can't just give me a topic and say, give me 500 word wisdom. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, not at all. It's going to be a bland speech that someone could have just copied off the internet from somebody else and given that. So I let them know that this is a unique product that we work together as partners rather than just me being a solo writer and writing them some nice words to say. Yeah, excellent. And like, are you doing kind of like a free introductory call to see are you the right fit? Is, is that the way? And how long do you do? Is it like 15 minutes, 30 minutes? Yeah, it's about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, we just, you know, go over price, we go over structure, we go over just the general game plan and what they're hoping to achieve. And of course, the timeline as well, because sometimes people reach out to me and they say, I need a speech tomorrow. And that's never going to happen. Uh, it's just, I can't do a good rush job. No one can. And if you're trying to get a speech at the last minute, you're going to get something that's far below quality, far below what you could have gotten had you asked a few months before. And if you are on these, uh, say, introductory calls, do you get price objections? And is that a kind of no to you, we're not a right fit? Or do you have kind of responses to justify the pricing? So both. I think if there's somebody who's looking for a true bargain deal, where it's way below what I quoted them, then you know we're not a right fit. But other times I can go back to research that's been done by the Professional Speech Writers Association and other writing groups and say, hey, this is what the market is um, asking for this type of work. And this is what I'm basing my rates on. So they can see that it's a third party validating it. It's not just somebody trying to take their money. And instead it's, this is what professional writers charge. This is what you should be expected and if you do go lower than that, you're going to get a much more poor quality of product. Like, let's say you want to go on to Fiverr or Upwork and you get speech for 50 bucks. Well, your speech is going to be worth 50 bucks. And, you know, you're rolling the dice at that point for what you get in terms of quality. Brilliant, brilliant. And I know you're working on a book is due to be released, yeah? That's correct. It's called Toast, Short Speeches, Big Impact. And it's going to be coming out in April of 2022, and it's going to help people write a toast, whether it's for a wedding, a retirement, an award ceremony, all of those small moments in our life that cause the greatest anxiety. I'm going to help you uh, take my system that I use with each one of my clients and apply it to your own work. Excellent, excellent. And what advice would you give people then, like getting started you know to kind of getting into the thought process because at the end of the day they're creating something like how do you advise them i mean i think we all have our own ways of doing it i kind of do like you mentioned you know you do your intro your conclusion and your bullet points but for somebody to gather their thoughts and everything like what what, what kind of tips would you give people so let's say we're starting a, a wedding toast. It's all about asking the right questions. So some of those questions might be, you know, tell me about the best qualities about this person. What are some of the funniest things this person says? What are your favorite stories about the person? Um, when were they really there for you? Um, what were they like growing up? Tell them stories that really truly honor the person. And then you want to do a second thing where you honor the event. You want to talk about the meaning of the event. Well, what does this marriage mean? What does the marriage of this couple mean to you? And if you can take those stories of the person you're honoring and the stories of honoring the event and put them together, then you've got a solid foundation for a toast. Brilliant. And like you mentioned that you learn stuff. What other kind of things have you learned over the years as kind of coach, I presume? Like things that you wish you would have known because i know some of the listeners are coaches some aspire to be coaches what other things did you happened that you could kind of go mm, yeah wish i had known that one 
I think anytime somebody starts talking about price um, immediately, it's going to be a very difficult client. Um, they're looking for the rock bottom deal that you can give them. And that's almost always a red flag that this is going to be a very difficult client to work with. Same thing with their availability. If there's someone who is just not available to you um, and wants to do everything with you know, multiple weeks notice, it's going to take a long time to work with that person. So instead, you want to work with the people who are going to be available for you and that are going to take your calls, respond to your emails. Those are going to be the clients that you want to work with. But if you feel that something is off early on, trust that instinct because most likely you're right. And have you worked out a kind of average conversion rate? You know, you talk to three, you convert one or talk to 10, you convert one. Or, like, do, I know it, you can be have a week where you're just talking to people that aren't the right fit and the next week it be the opposite. But is there a kind of, have you figured out, yeah, I, I'm on track when I have X conversion? I haven't put a direct number to it, but it's usually pretty high. I know that if I get a referral through my website, if I get a through something through the contact form, we're most likely going to work together because that person has read the website. They've, I've answered their questions already, and I know they're pretty much ready to buy at that point. So it's pretty easy to understand that most people who come to me, when they reach the, the phase of finally reaching out and making that contact, they're ready to work. Um, and I've got a pretty high number. I don't know what it is specifically, but I would say anywhere from about 75% to 80% of those who contact me, we end up working together. No, that's an excellent uh, conversion rate. Yeah, no, brilliant. So, kind of finally, because I, I, I like knowing people's social media, what, what works, what doesn't work, but kind of marketing yourself as well, because now you'll be doing the book, and I presume you've been thinking of that. I mean, I've seen the, the graphics that it, you've done. It looks good. You know, it's something that would grab your attention. But marketing yourself for the service you do, what kind of tips could you share with people for that? Uh, very much build an email list. Um, that's a huge, huge thing to do. Um, you have a direct relationship with the people on your email list, and you can guarantee that they're going to open your emails, at least a certain percentage of them. Versus something like social media, you can't always guarantee that if you put a post up, everyone in your network is going to see it. Um, so I, I want to do a little bit more social media, but it's not one of my top things to do. I believe in emails, and I also believe in podcasting. I believe in going on shows like this having a direct relationship with the listeners uh, of those who are listening and being able to talk to them directly. I think any time that you're able to talk to a fan or a potential fan one-on-one -on -one or in a medium like this, you've got a much better shot than just posting something on social media and hoping that it catches fire. Uh, because too many posts, you just post it up there and it goes away. Um, and I don't like doing that and wasting time. Yeah, no, I, I, I think especially when you're doing a book that the podcasting is brilliant because it's a great way of reaching the audience. And I know I've been on a lot of shows. It was mainly in Pakistan that I was invited to a lot of stuff and I just done it kind of as a way of giving back. And the amount of people that started following me based on that. So when you're doing it, you know, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if you touch, you know, one or two people, if two people reach out to you to do it, it justifies it. But the other thing is, I know some people get addicted to it and they, because there's, there's different platforms where like the pod match is fantastic. I, I actually, I find it, it, it really makes life easier, but I also know that some people get addicted to it. They're trying to get, and they're doing like five or six a day and you have to kind of a bit of yin and yang with, okay, I need to put, keep my eye on the business, build the business, but you know, use it as a lead generation. Oh, very much. And I think if you're doing five or six a day, that's just a recipe for burnout. It's just yeah. another form of public speaking. And imagine someone giving five to six speeches a day, unless you're a diplomat or a politician, that's a really hard schedule to maintain. So I would definitely tell anyone out there to pace themselves with promotion and look at it in the terms of the long view. It's a long game that you're playing here. I'm expecting to put a year of promotion into the book. Um, it's not going to be a flash in the pan just for launch week, it's going to be a year long promotion effort and I'll have to pace myself and I hope others do too. And I'm just curious, cause I mean, I, I'm actually writing five books at the moment. I've one done, but I kind of, I was told to hold off on it. And I know some of the 
companies that promote different things i'm doing it myself but i know what they do is they they give out the kind of kindle version free for the first few weeks just to get up the charts and everything is that something that you're going to do or what's your thoughts on your kind of launch sure i'll have a pre-launch price probably at 99 cents um and after the the launch goes um i'll uh set the book back up to another price probably 4.99 or 9.99 on amazon I'm going to have to just A, B test it and play around to see which one's going to get the best conversion rate. It's going to be a big test since this is my first book. I wish you best of luck. And I know that with what you've shared today, that there's you know, plenty of tips that will be in it to help people because you know everyone is doing a speech at some stage, whether it's a keynote, a funeral, whatever it is, and any bit of tips and tricks will help you in, in life. So listen, Eddie, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. How can people get in contact with you? Uh, they can find me at ricespeechwriting.com. That's R-I-C-E followed by speechwriting.com. Uh, all my information is there on the website, including a sign up for my book where you can get the first chapter for free if you sign up for the newsletter. Excellent. Okay, perfect. And I'll make sure I put the link in the podcast description, both on the audio and the video. So thank you very much, Eddie. Thank you, Roy. That's all for the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com, as mentioned, from BitChute and YouTube. And I'm also other podcasts at RoyCollin.com. Sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating. Until next week, take care.